Hey everyone, welcome back to the Last Night Was Literally a Movie podcast. I'm your host, Celsty, and this week there's no Naomi on the pod because Naomi did not watch The Last of Us. Spoiler alert, we're talking about The Last of Us. But my dad did, so my dad is here. Dad, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dad, and I got a question right before we get started in this. Uh, this is last night was a movie, but this wasn't really necessarily a movie. It was a TV series, or what we call a streaming series. What would you call? I mean, what do we call these things? Just episodic t- shows, I don't know, a show, yeah. a TV show. Anyway, so last night was not literally a movie. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Yeah, so I am uh, Naomi and Celeste's dad, and I am uh, guesting on the Last Night Was a Movie podcast, so um, um, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, cool. So we're going to be talking about each episode, and um, I have my opinions about it. My dad definitely has his opinions about it, and yeah. Wait a minute, each episode? Yeah. All like there was like eight, right? There's nine. Nine, nine episodes? Okay, okay. Especially if we go like fast. Oh yeah. That's just a lot. Okay. Five minutes per episode. We get it done. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm gonna summarize each of them and then we're gonna talk. Got it. Episode one introduces us to Sarah, Joel's daughter. We follow her throughout through her day as she prepares a watch to give to Joel. That night, she wakes up and finds her neighbor's dog has escaped, so she goes to take the go- dog back and finds her neighbor has become a zombie and eaten everyone in the house. Joel arrives to, arrives to kill the zombie, and they escape with Tommy, Joel's brother, Things go south when an airplane crashes, causes their car to flip. Everyone escapes the crash, but a a soldier stops Joel and Sarah and shoots Sarah before Tommy arrives to shoot the soldier. Sarah is dead. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't care about spoilers? No. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Continue. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Time skip 20 years into the future. Joel lives with Tess in a quarantine zone, and he's trying to get a car so he can go find Tommy in Wyoming. They find out that their battery was sold to Marlene, and when they go to get it back, they find that the battery didn't even work. Marlene tells Joel and Tess that if they take Ellie and some to some of Marlene's friends, the Fireflies, they'll give Joel and Tess a car. They agree to sneak Ellie out of the QZ, but get stopped by a soldier whose test reveals that Ellie is infected. Joel kills the soldier and the gang runs off. Okay. So that was the summary. Yeah. So um, do you have any like leading questions for me before? This episode was really long and I think I watched it a total of three times. One with one of my friends, one with my dad and one with uh, Naomi. What do you think about the length? Do you think that the hour and a half was justified for this episode? Okay, so I I will, in full disclosure, tell you and the audience uh, that whoever's listening out there that I have been listening to a another podcast specifically about The Last of Us. And so the host is the guy from the game, Joel from the game, something Barker, Trey Troy Bar- Barker. Troy Barker, yeah, so... Um, anyway, so I have been listening to that and I, and to gain some insights, cause I knew I was going to do this. And so, um, right off the bat, the first episode, they filmed it like just a little backstory. They filmed both episodes, like they were supposed to be two episodes. And so right where in the middle, uh, when the flashback or the flash forward happens, Uh, the end of the first episode was supposed to end right there where Joel was stacking the bodies. Um, you know, that, I guess that's how you get food or work or money or credits or whatever you help stack the dead bodies. So that was supposed to be the end of the episode. But, um, one thing they talked about is, uh, they wanted to make sure that the audience came back. Um, and watched a second episode and they, in the, in this is where the studio's executives, they said, got involved. So the studio executive said, Hey, you know, this really didn't do it for me. And I think we need to combine those two episodes. I hope I can, I'm getting this right. Um, if anybody from the last of us podcast would be out there listening, <laughs> I hope I'm getting the, yeah, I hope I'm getting this right. That by combining the two episodes, 
um, they they didn't just make it about a zombie apocalypse, quote unquote, since you know it's fungus, but uh, they didn't make it just about a zombie apocalypse. But they really transitioned the viewer into the characters and got you kind of you know because once you care about the characters and, and understand who they are and where they're coming from, then you really kind of come back for the for the uh, for the next episode. So this one was actually going to be one and two. Um, and, and I thought, and my thought on that one, um, before we skip to the second one, I guess, cause I might be running out of time. My thought on that one is that they were absolutely right. I did not. So I played the game. The game was fine. I played some of the game. Let's say I did not, you know, I did not finish it. Um, but my thought on that was, uh, they were absolutely right to combine those two episodes because at first I did not. I, I had no, I did not have high hopes for The Last of Us as a TV series. I was thinking it was just going to go, uh, it was going to be, you know, your standard run of the mill action adventure, zombie apocalypse, post apocalyptic, you know, the world crumbled and, you know, it's just going to be a bunch of um, weird humanoid like creatures walking around and then you got to shoot them and that was kind of how the game was but that's fine for a game because it's a game you know like you you want that but in a but in a uh, episodic series like this one i don't think you necessarily want that so i think they were right to combine those two episodes and that's why it was super long but i think what's what was super interesting about this show we i i don't know if i should talk about this at the end whatever it's about a zombie apocalypse, but like there's not any zombies in the actual show. Yes, I like that part like, of it. Most too. of the episodes just no zombies. It's about like other stuff and like people, which I think is so interesting because it's like, you know, the zombie apocalypse wrecked the world and but it's still like people messing it up at the end of the day. Yeah, and that's how they get you to come back in. That's you know, the they cast the net out there and they reel you back in, you know, with the fact that you know, they are finding bits of humanity in this chaos. And uh, as I, the, the more episode I watched, the more I began to realize that that's what they were aiming for. Yeah, like, I think it's it's so interesting because I think there's only, like, one, two, three, four interactions with zombies throughout the entire series. There's oh, the, the entire series? Yeah. yeah. There's, uh -huh. like, the clicker in episode two that bites tests there's mm -hmm. um <clears throat> there's the big zombie attack in uh the one with sam and henry yeah the giant yeah zombie there's um oh yeah there's the one that ellie finds in the gas station yeah i don't remember that one where she's like she cuts its head open with the knife with the yeah. switch knife yeah, I'm gonna have to watch that one again. But okay, okay. whatever. Anyway, so yeah, there's it. It wasn't as much as you thought. Yeah, like you would think. And, and I, I think that's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought it was well done uh, because we all know how you know zombies you know walk around or zombie like creatures just walk around and you know they're relentless and they sneak up on you and stuff. We all know that. So I think the beauty of the Last of Us here is that. You know, it didn't have to adhere to the video game rules of play, like, you know, where you have to have some, so much action every couple of minutes or seconds or the gamer won't continue to engage with it and they'll just turn it off. But you don't necessarily have to do that in a, in a uh, show like this. So. Yeah, because it, it's a lot more fun to shoot zombies in a video game than to watch people shoot zombies in a TV show. Yeah, yeah. And then you're not going to sit there at the video game and dissect one, you know. Like, yeah. So. so yeah, that's episode one. Okay. Yep. Episode two. Joel and Tess are trying to figure out what they should do. And if they really believe Ellie is immune to the infection, they're convinced to continue. And they wander through the streets of Boston, trying to find their way to the Capitol building where Mylene's friends are waiting. They cut through a building and are attacked by zombies. Ellie is bit and the gang takes the zombies out. They get to the Capitol building and find out that all of Marlene's friends are dead Tess reveals that she also got bit and the infection is spreading. She convinces Joel to take Ellie all the way west to Marlene's other friends uh, before blowing up the Capitol building as Joel and Ellie make their escape. Okay, so, I mean, my thoughts on this second episode is um, 
you know, this is really where I guess you get to the meat of what the rest of the series is going to be about. And, you know, Joel, the kind of the reluctant hero is been, um, he's been enlisted by, um, what, not, um, what was her name? Not Marlene, uh, Tess. Yeah. He's been enlisted by Tess to, you know, help, um, Ellie get to, uh, these people that can either help her or help humanity. Right. So, but that's not what he wants to do. He really wants to go save his brother in this episode. If you, if you really are kind of paying attention to it, because his brother Joel and him are communicating. This is where we learn about the eighties music and you know, how it means something. So they're communicating somehow with this shortwave radio or whatever. So Joel really wants to go visit his brother cause he hadn't heard from him. He wants to go find out what happened to him. And so that's his motivation but in there, um, while he is uh, really trying to make his escape and do that, then Tess really kind of impresses upon him the importance of Ellie, you know, the girl that maybe can save, you know, she has some, some characteristic about her that can save humanity. So, yeah, Joel here is the reluctant hero, and the and that's how he starts out, but that's not how he ends up in this episode. He really kind of finds... I guess his direction by the end of this episode. Yeah, because at the end of the e- episode, Tess like make makes Joel promise to <clears throat> take Ellie all the way there, and I think his original plan was to drop her off with Bill and Frank, but that didn't work out. But um, oh, you think that was Tess's original plan to drop? Well, her no, off? Joel's original, oh, original plan, plan was to do okay, that because yeah. he thought Bill and Frank could get her there better. Which but, we don't know who Bill and Frank is till the next episode. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. And also, Bill and Frank were the one with the '80s music radio code. Uh, and Tommy communicated with Joel through that guy and the who was like talking to Joel. Okay, so it episode. wasn't just one to one. Yeah. But somehow, uh, somehow, um, Joel knew that Tommy stopped communicating. Yeah, because the guy with like the bigger radio tower. Okay, yeah. That okay. he saw in the first episode. Whatever. That's specifics. No one actually cares. Uh, this episode I thought was so impressive. Because a lot of this episode is fo- focused on, like, the environment of Boston and what, like, the neglect has done to this city and how nature has taken it back. Like, that's a, apparently this this recent trend of, like, a green apocalypse where it's not, like, the world that ends, but just humanity that ends. And the world is allowed to take back, yeah, like, so humanity's it's, creations. It's not like what you see in Waterworld or Mad Max where the world descends into this... A barren wasteland. Yeah. Yeah. Nature actually takes over. And so plants and animals flourish, you know, that aren't the ones that aren't affected by the cordyceps, you know, they flourish in this environment. So, yeah, I thought that was really well done. I'm, I'm sure it makes for an amazingly difficult CGI. Yeah. Well, I, what I found out, I watched some VFX people talking about this. They, um, all of the backgrounds weren't actually like, 3d model renders and stuff they were matte paintings and that allowed them to make them a lot quicker because like because of how vast the space was it was way easier to just have Mm -hmm. a person paint that than to model that and basically like wherever you don't see the characters stepping or interacting then that's a matte painting and that's for every single shot which is just insane so that's old school that's old school special effects yeah. there, right? Because, I mean, yeah. they're not gonna, they're not there long enough for them to justify... Or they're not in any one location long enough to justify, like, getting yeah. this whole 3D environment set up. So, yeah, I can see how you grow an appreciation for the environment around Boston yeah. and, and then all it's, that. Yeah, and, and it's also, episode. like, some hmm. of the camera stuff that happens. Because, like, depth of field works differently with, like, a flat map painting versus an actual environment. So they had to do a ton of stuff to make that work out and stuff, which was super cool. This episode is... Very highly technical fun if you, like, know what you're looking at. Yeah, and I don't know what I'm looking at. Yeah, but to anyone else, it's just like, yeah, they're walking around the deserted streets of Boston. Who cares? But to somebody who's like, oh, my God, this is crazy. It's like, oh, my God, this is crazy. I thought it was fun. That's episode two. Episode three? Episode three. Um, Actually, my favorite episode. My favorite episode two. Yeah. All right. Let's go. This was the episode that convinced me to watch the show because I kept seeing people talking about it on like TikTok and stuff and how it's like the best episode ever. So I was like, fine, I'll watch it, whatever. 
uh, episode three, flashback to Outbreak Day, where Bill, a doomsday prepper, refuses to leave his house when the army uh, comes to like evacuate everybody. By he, the way, Bill is played by Nick Offerman, which yeah, is amazing. That was that, yeah. a great choice. Yeah. Uh, he builds a fence and traps. Uh, he builds a fence and traps around his neighborhood and lives in solitude for a couple years. One day, though, Frank falls into one of his traps while trying to get to Boston. Bill reluctantly invites uh, Frank into his home for a shower and a meal, and they slowly start to reveal their affection towards each other. They live together, uh, for, and a couple years pass. Uh, Frank tells Bill that he's been talking to people over the radio and Bill gets mad. These people that Fr uh, Bill was talking to or that Frank was talking to uh, are revealed to be Joel and Tess. And after coming to the compound, they become friends with Bill and Frank. More years pass and Bill is now treating Frank for a terminal illness. Uh, Frank tells Bill that he doesn't want to live with this illness and asks Bill for one more good day before taking a ton of meds and dying in his sleep. Bill reluctantly agrees. They get married, have a good day. Um, and then Bill also takes the, the pills with Frank and they die together. Ellie and Joel get there to discover what's happened. They take Bill's truck and begin their cross country trek. Okay, so, um, yeah, like I said, this was my favorite episode, and I like it for all of the, uh, I guess, the dynamics of it, the contrast. So the, the yin and yang that was presented in this episode. So starting first with Bill, who, are we just going to jump right into it and reveal who Bill is? Like, so Bill and the nature of his relationship with Frank, right? Bill and Frank? Yeah. So... Bill, who is this um, a doomsday prepper, right, living in what appears to be probably his parents' house or something, you know, it's kind of weird that a man of his age would be just, like, living in the basement, you know, of a house. So I kind of imagine that might be his, you know, his parents' house or whatever. So, um, and so uh, things we associate with a doomsday prepper are like really socially conservative. And I hate to bring this up and put it in a political context, but I think it's relevant here is a very socially conservative, maybe right wing type voter, you know, that type of stuff, uh, you know, high, you know, high on moral values and code and all that. Uh, but yet, as we see later in the episode, he develops this relationship with Frank uh, and it um, it contrasts with everything we thought we knew about Bill or the type of person that he is supposed to be, right? So you have that contrast right there that um, it's not really a surprise or anything, but it, it or a shock. There's not a whole lot of shock value in there, but it is something that you know you have to consider. Did you just um, you know look at Bill and stereotype him? as this one thing you know i did i certainly did yeah i think this is this contributes to my theory that these crazy doomsday prepper type people aren't actually crazy doomsday prepper type people they just want friends and they find friends in other crazy doomsday prepper type people yeah and so when bill finds frank he doesn't have to be this crazy doomsday prepper anymore he can just be in a relationship with Frank because that's yeah. that fulfills that need. Yeah. That's my personal theory about all this stuff. <laughs> and I think it's funny. So after, I mean, you know, after you watch this or after I watch this episode, I got a, I got a sense that, um, regardless of, you know, how you feel about Bill and Frank's relationship and whatnot, the episode was so well done. I mean, from, just the storyline, the character development, um, the interaction between Bill and Frank. And I mean, it, um, so I will admit I probably was almost brought to tears, if not just brought straight out, brought to tears in the final scene. And God help you if you are listening to this podcast and you haven't seen this episode yet. But in the final scene, when Bill prepares dinner for Frank one last time because Frank knows he's going to die soon and so he wants to commit suicide he wants Frank to help him 
But he says to him, you know, I want just one more good day, you know, because I had this conversation about there's good days and bad days and that's the nature of love and whatnot. And so Frank says, hey, I just want one more good day. And Bill prepares the exact same meal that he prepared on the first day that they met. And, um, you know, and that kind of to me revealed that Bill knew at the beginning that that was a good day. Maybe he didn't realize it that day, but he knew at the beginning of the relationship that that really was a good day, that he um, trusted Frank to not take advantage of him and his place and all that. And then when, and so that kind of revealed to me that Bill was kind of in that space all along. He prepared that final meal for him and did the whole thing, like set the place down and, rotated it and then Frank unrotated it. It's just amazing. Yeah, it was really well done. Yeah, that I I I was bawling, tissues flying when uh Frank was talking to Bill and saying like I just want one more good day. Yes. Gonna, and he's like, we're gonna go get married. I'm gonna dress you how I want to and you're not gonna complain. And I was like, oh my God, don't yeah. don't say that. I can't. That's way too much. Yeah, I think that speaks a lot or volumes to the to the writers. Uh, the, yeah. yeah. The genius and of I, the writers. And I heard like um the the reason that this show that like the creator of The Last of Us was so excited to make this show was because it allowed him to like fully realize these parts of the story that he couldn't with the game. Because obviously you can't do it 45 minute flashback into two characters f- for a video game because there's no gameplay there but for a show you can just do that and it's like the best episode yeah 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 and i think that's like <clears throat> it's it's a very powerful episode yeah like ironically the best episode yeah ironically the best episode in the whole series was one that completely stepped out of the game for which the show is based on so yeah um Anyway, yeah, it was really well done, and I you could even tell people if you see none of the other episodes, like if you you could probably jump in right there on episode three and watch that one and feel good about watching that episode three and yeah, because it's just a good episode yeah, regardless. Yeah. Like you don't even need to know the context of like who Joel and Ellie are or who what their mission is or anything about that. Like yeah, yeah, it it definitely stands alone. It it's yeah. incredible, really. Episode three. Yeah. And if we had like another hour or so, we could probably sit here. Yeah, we could probably still keep talking about it. It's the best. We got to move on. Yeah. Okay, good. Episode four. Joel and Ellie are traveling through Kansas City when they're attacked by raiders. Joel kills two of them and Ellie kills the last with a gun she stole from Bill and Frank's. The bandit gang discovers this or the rest of the bandit gang discovers the the dead bodies and sends an army to look out to look for Joel thinking that this might be connected to another enemy of theirs Henry Joel and Ellie climb up into a high rise building to sleep until morning and make their escape they are woken by Henry and his brother Sam holding them at gunpoint bah, bah, bah. oh my god cliffhanger yeah okay the, so that that's where it ends yeah right okay yeah so the thing I thought about this episode was, um, you know, like, first off, why Kansas City? Like, I don't know. They're going, I thought they were going to a more northern state. Like, they were trying to get to, like, Yeah, it seems Utah? like they went, like, really south. But yeah. maybe that's just because of the map protections we're looking at and because, like, the curvature of the <laughs> earth, that's a more direct path. Because I know planes do that sometimes. Well, yeah, there's a great circle route. Uh, we won't even get into that and how I know that, but yes, that <laughs> happens. But uh, uh, land navigation is completely different, and I don't know. Maybe they were just trying to stay out of the cold, or I don't know, favorable weather conditions. But anyway, so what I um, really want to get into is um, in, in so in the podcast that I've been listening to, they talked about the nature of the relationship with Bill and Frank. Right. So going back to episode three. So Bill protects Frank. Right. And so Frank gives Bill purpose. Right. So in this episode, we see finally start seeing Joel open up to Ellie and um, and you understand that Joel protects Ellie and Ellie gives Joel purpose. So, and I thought that was great about this episode. Um, yes, we know that Joel, you know, once Tess dies in episode two, we know that Joel finally kind of understands what he's supposed to do. 
And then we're kind of interrupted by episode three, which was great, but it doesn't advance this main storyline with Joel and Ellie much. Comes back to it in four, and then you really get a sense that Joel has understands his purpose now, um, and that is to protect Ellie. Ellie gives him that purpose. So that's what I that's what I got out of episode four. Um, is is this really the one where uh, what's the Firefly? Um, leader name what's her name catherine or something or these aren't the fireflies these are just some random bandits okay, okay. that took over kansas city so we're not there yet i might be skipping ahead to episode five but okay um so then yeah then this episode ends up so they go through they kill the guy in a shootout in like a barber shop or something and then they go fall asleep and they're supposed to be on watch you know, like, I'll take the first watch, you take the second or whatever, you know, and then they both fall asleep and, yeah, then Henry and Sam show up, right? Yeah. yeah. This episode is not that as, like, narratively dense as the other episodes. Yeah. And there's not really much to talk about with it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty light. I didn't really, I mean, I, w- I wish there would have been more of this Henry and Sam characters. Maybe they could have drug them along a little bit, but... Yeah, this episode focuses a lot on, like, the bandits' search for Sam and Henry and building them up as these super dangerous, like, criminals. But, I don't know. I didn't really care about it that much. Yeah. Okay. Episode Uh, five. Episode five. Henry and Sam talk with Ellie and Joel, and they agree to sneak out of the city together. It's revealed that Henry ratted on the leader of the bandits uh, to the government so that he could get Sam's leukemia meds, and that's why the bandits are after him. They sneak through some tunnels and emerge in the suburbs when a sniper at the end of a cul-de-sac starts shooting at them. Joel takes him out, but then but the army of bandits find them and pin them down. All hope is lost until a horde of zombies emerges from underground and take out the army. Joel and gang fights their way out and uh, go to spend the night in an, in an abandoned motel where Sam shows Ellie that he got bit during the fight. Ellie tries to save him with her immune blood, but it doesn't work and Henry has to kill Sam before killing himself. Joel and Ellie bury them and they continue west. Yeah, I think really I wanted the immunity to work right you were kind of hoping that sam would he you wake up and he'd wake up in the morning and he wasn't infected so i really wanted it to work because like i was saying in the last one i really wanted these characters to stick around a little bit longer you know i thought that there was uh, a lot more that could be developed there um so and maybe the point of the immunity not working was that uh, just because Ellie's immune, that doesn't mean that she can pass that trait on to other humans. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out in the last episode or season two. I don't know. Yeah. So this this was very this was very sad because like I forgot about Sam and Henry in the video game, and so when they were introduced, I didn't know what was going to happen to them. Like I forgot that they were there because I haven't played the game in years. And so I was really like hoping that they would because I knew they eventually made it to Wyoming and Tommy's. And I was really hoping that Sam and Henry would follow them to get oh, to be, Tommy's. Yeah, but come along too. alas, and it was super sad. And also I was kind of really excited for them to go down in the tunnels because something that the games sometimes do is explore this horror element with the zombies Especially because in the games, the zombies have spores, too, that create this super spooky environmental effect. But they didn't do that, and I was kind of mad and upset about it. They oh, better do where, that. like, the zombies can emit spores and you can get infected that way? Yeah, oh, they okay. don't do that in the show because mm. then they would have to have their actors wear gas masks, and they don't want the actors to do that because it inhibits the actors. Yeah, like wearing football helmets and you can't yeah. see the players. Yeah, okay. Um, and then also I heard... That at the end of the episode, uh, when Sam, like, is, um, after Sam gets infected, he faces away from Ellie so that he doesn't see her. Because when the zombie infection takes over his brain, the infection doesn't know that Ellie's back there. And Sam is deaf, so he's not going to be able to hear Ellie. So, like, he doesn't believe that this... Ellie's blood is going to work, that he's going to become infected, whatever, all hope is lost. And so he turns around so that, like, he won't attack Ellie in her sleep. 
Wait, wait a minute. Yes. So I hadn't considered that before that Sam was deaf. And so part of the characteristic of the infected, when you get infected with the cordyceps is you're blind. Well, you're not blind right away. Oh, okay. You okay. become blind as the infection like spreads. So exploring the Sam's infection more, if he's deaf, would he get his hearing back? No, because it's like, the- I guess it's just like, it's not, the, the ears weren't even connected to the brain, so there was no way the the fungus could get it. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. See, I, th- I think they really could have explored that a little bit more with Sam and Henry and Sam. But- well, I mean, again, it's like, they do subtle things like that to add to it, but they're not going to explore it because they're not really interested in the logistics of that. They're more interested in like the characters. Yeah. And I think what, what grabbed me about Henry and Sam was the father son connection. So well, they're brothers. Well, yeah, but (laughs) the, um, the father son connection is in Joel has the same father daughter connection with Ellie, even though they're not related, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, a, a uh, caregiver connection. Yeah, the caregiver, I guess. And so as a, you know, as a caregiver, you know, like as a as a head of a family or father of a household, then yeah, you do, you know, everything within your power to protect them and save them. And we've seen that now with Joel and Sarah earlier. And then um, and how Sarah dying, you know, really affected Joel for this 20 year span or whatever you know where he's in this funk and he just can't get out and then now but now he has purpose with ellie and so he's protecting her and then um sam and henry also have this um i guess better term caregiver connection and so i think that's why i was thinking you know seeing the parallels of all three of those um i you know those uh concepts there play out in the so I was I was hoping for more out of that, but it just it didn't materialize. Yeah, very sad, very sad ending. I wish we could have seen more of them. But okay, no. Oh, oh. So sad ending, yes. However, um, yes, I was right. Kathleen Coglin is the leader of that group, right? Yeah. I tell you, I absolutely and hate is a strong word, but I absolutely <laughs> hated her character. Uh, oh yeah just yeah. like the way that she talks down oh, to people yeah, all the she time was, she was so condescending to everyone yeah like i would have preferred it if she was just mean and not yes. just like you're really stupid oh my gosh it was terrible and so um even though yes the tragedy of henry and sam was great and you know you know was not great but it was sad um I, I thought, you know, Kathleen getting her come up and at the end, you know, with all the zombies, with all the infected. Very you know. satisfying. Yeah, very satisfying. Definitely. Okay. Episode six. Joel and Ellie make their way west to find a community in Wyoming. Or in, they make their way west and find a community in Wyoming where Joel's brother Tommy lives. Joel asks Tommy to take Ellie to the hospital where the doctors will try and find a cure for the zombies because he doesn't think that he can do it himself. Ellie finds out and gets mad at Joel. Um, So he gets over his fear and agrees to continue his journey with Ellie. They get to the hospital and find that the doctors left for Salt Lake City. uh, They're attacked by different bandits and Joel is stabbed. Ellie takes him to a house and tries to nurse him back to health. Okay, so episode six, uh, the the thing I remember about episode six, and it's more just a feeling than anything else, is uh, if you've ever seen, and I'm going to compare it to an, a movie, if you've ever seen Dances with Wolves, and um, it was it came out in the 90s, it was Kevin Costner, and the setting, the American West, uh, post-Civil War American West, the setting was so instrumental to how the story played out, you know, um, and the isolation that you felt in the American West uh, during that time period that um, that the Kevin Costner character, and I can't remember his name in the film, but um, the, the isolation that he felt seemed to parallel the same isolation that Joel and Ellie find themselves in um, even after encountering the uh, the community that um, what what's Joel's brother's name again? Tommy. Tommy. Yeah. Even after encountering the community that Tommy's in, 
uh, they still seem to be isolated. And the, the backdrop of all that isolation is this mountainous West, you know, where it is vast and open and, you know, these mountains are forbidding and you could go in there and get lost and be and isolate, you know, fairly easily. And I think that's part of the community. The community wants to be isolated, you know? And so I just really got a sense in this one of just the sheer isolation that they must've felt, you know, as they're, traveling you know trying to seek out that medical facility so does that make sense yeah okay i i I liked it whenever they were out in the wilderness i breathed a sigh of relief for all the set designers that didn't have to design any set for these scenes yeah they could just go camping yeah film out in the woods because after the second episode with like the heavy everything that was going on it was such a sigh of relief for them to just be out among yeah. trees and that was their scene yeah and if you've ever been through kansas city when they're recreating the the city you know like that's a city i'm fairly familiar with you know living in the midwest for so long but uh, you know if you've ever been through kansas city you you've got to as a set designer like make it you got to put those images in there and make it familiar and they did a good job. Yeah, there were so many times when like they would go to a location and I would just think, wow, people that are that live in, at this place are freaking out right now. They're like, that's my home. That's my home. Yeah. I know that place. I go there every weekend or whatever. Or they're saying, no, that's not right. They didn't get that right. Yeah. You know, right, right, right. To, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I thought the, all the cities were really well done. but and, and then I thought that it was well done that they put them in such a remote location in this backdrop or the setting was instrument episode six yeah pretty good episode seven uh we get flashback to before ellie got bit her friend riley who joined marlene's gang sneaks ellie out to an abandoned mall where they hang out play games and have fun before riley tells ellie that she's moving to atlanta ellie's mad they talk it out uh they make up they kiss and then they are attacked by a zombie ellie kills it but they both get bit they agree to wait it out and go crazy together. Okay, so this was probably um, not my least favorite episode, but it wasn't really high up on the episodes. And really? I, yeah, and the reason why is I could not get over the fact that they're in this mall, and I've just come off of watching, I don't know, three, four seasons of freaking Stranger Things. <laughs> where so much of the setting is in a mall. And I was like, okay, the rest of these episodes of Last of Us are so great. Why are they in this mall? And I kept, I was just praying that it would not turn into some sort of, you know, really kind of, you know, poppy, you know, like really kind of lowbrow humor and comedy and stuff like that. And, and, and that they would keep it real and true to the series. And so they did, but I, like the whole time I just could not help thinking that this is going to go bad. This He's is going to be bad. PTSD from stranger things <laughs> yeah. going to the mall. Yeah. I think this episode is really good. And I heard, I watched uh, some video essay about Ellie's character today. And at the end of the episode, Riley and Ellie are talking about like th- their zombie bites and Riley says like I don't want to just shoot myself and get it over with like I want to fight for every minute that I have to spend with each other even if it's two minutes or two days and and, and then it flashes back to Ellie and Joel and that's when Ellie makes the decision to keep fighting to nurse joel back to health to keep fighting to get joel to live even if it's just for one more day or if it's two weeks you know so refresh my memory did ellie have to end up kill killing riley to save her from being zombified herself yeah yeah okay so and that correct me if i'm wrong that might be ellie's first time she had to kill somebody yeah she says that later on she tells joel that yeah, and I think that was a, a telling moment. Was it in the same episode where she tells Joel that, "Hey, I've done this. That wasn't my first. You know, basically, I'm I not think a virgin." The one, the I, this wasn't my first was when she k- kills the guy in Kansas City, and then oh, she okay. tells Joel about how she had to kill Riley. I yeah. think in the last or second to last episode. 
Okay. 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 Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I mean, yeah, the interaction between Ellie and Riley is great and all. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I just couldn't get over the, they were in the mall and this is going to kind of be hokey and, you know, it, it ultimately wasn't like that, but it's like, I was scared for it. <laughs> yeah. This episode was also called left behind and the DLC in the game was called left behind this the sequence was a DLC in the original game. And I think that title is so very good for Ellie's character because like in episode six, when she's trying to convince Joel to not just dump her off with Tommy, she talks about how every single person that she's been close to has left her behind. And so this is just, this is Riley was the first of many people to leave her behind. And I mean, Maybe there was her mom before that that she never got to know. And in the in the games, there's a point about how her mom wrote Ellie a letter before she mm. died. Um, but they they don't do that in the in this show. In the, yeah, in the yeah, show. I don't have the, okay. Yeah. So you know there are some there were some redeeming qualities about this episode. I liked it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I think you're I just mean, you, you were so biased <laughs> against it from the start. Yeah, maybe I have to go back and rewatch this one. I'll watch number. Th- I'll watch the third one and then go watch this one again. So. Yeah, right. episode seven, episode eight, traumatizing. All right, what was that one? Uh, back to the present day. Ellie leaves Joel to go find food. She shoots a deer, but two other people find the deer first. Ellie agrees to trade half the deer for penicillin to give to Joel. One of the men goes to get the meds while Ellie stays with the other. He reveals that the guy that stabbed Joel or the guy that stabbed Joel was a member of the cult and they killed that guy after he stabbed Joel and Ellie runs away to give Joel the penicillin. Uh, the cult follows her, though, and Ellie tries to lead them away from Joel, but gets captured. At the cult's camp, Ellie discovers that they're a cannibal cult, and they plan on making Ellie their next meal. Back with Joel, he takes out, he, like, wakes up, he takes out the cultists and um, get them to tell where tell him where they took Ellie. Ellie manages to escape the cage and starts to burn down one of their buildings. The leader tracks her down and tries to rape her. Ellie grabs a meat cleaver and dices his face, and then she and Joel escapes. Yeah, so this is, you really get a sense of how, one, how badass Joel is, and how badass Ellie is in this one. This is... It, this one was great. This episode is such a slow burn of like reveals that just make it worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Cause like first is like the suspicion that this food isn't right. Cause when they say like there's a scene when the cultists are making their food and the guy dumps it off with the chefs and, he, and they're like, what is this? And he's like venison. And he walks out and the chef just looks at him and everyone's just kind of silent and awkward. And oh, like, see, weird. I didn't pick up on that. And, and then, um, and then Ellie sees the ear just sitting yeah, on the floor, yeah. and then finds out that they're cannibals. Yeah. And then on top of being cannibals, their leader is also a pedophile, and that's yeah. so cute. I, I, yeah, I guess the, um, I, I guess in my nature is that I trust too much, and so I, I see you know goodness in in people first, and so I did not in the cult leader, I did not pick up the you know that th- there's probably something wrong here i just thought he was the leader of uh, this small community and that you know they were um uh, you know that they were good people you know and they they didn't have any issues you know and i didn't know exactly where this was going and yeah it was kind of a yeah you got me on this one i got fooled on that one because towards the end there when it was revealed that eh, something ain't quite right with this guy um yeah, when he tries to like get yeah. Ellie to marry him when she's still in the cage or something. Yeah, yeah. And then Ellie breaks his breaks finger. Breaks his finger, yeah, yeah. So, and you would think that me of all people would pick up on cult like activity. Uh, what y'all don't know about me is I was, uh, I went to college in Baylor University right outside of Waco um, in the, uh, mid nineties when the David Koresh and the seventh day Adventist cult that was there, um, was, a, you know, attacked by the FBI and the ATF and burned to the ground. And so you would think that I would recognize cult like activity after having gone through that. But, uh, this one, uh, I mean, maybe kudos to how well they played it off because that's how cults get you is they come in 
you know, in sheep's clothing. And then all of a sudden they unzip, you know, like from the cartoons, they unzip the sheep and the wolf comes out, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's how they get you. So maybe kudos to the overall production value of this episode is that they can really like reel you in. You're thinking, oh, this is great. You know, they find, you know, this other community of, you know, nice people and, you know, it doesn't turn out that way. Yeah, and like there's something at the end of the episode when Ellie is slicing and dicing the dude's face. Oh my gosh. That's that was... like, it's such a sigh of relief, but also really scary. Yes, and knowing, scary, knowing that what she's capable of. I mean, yeah. she, I don't know that I could have done it with that much force and like venom and, you know, in my blood. Yeah, but, but I mean, you also <laughs> weren't about to be eaten. And... Yeah, that's true. I mean, but yeah, she put that, she buried that meat cleaver right across like his jugular in his neck or somewhere like right in his head neck area yeah and very satisfying yeah, we love I, to see it i think i heard it like shank to the bone it went like shank you know hit the collarbone and the neck bone and like i mean she really got in there deep <laughs> yeah that's episode eight i was very glad when it was over yeah it's if, a very uncomfortable watch episode where's my mouse Okay. Episode nine opens with Ellie's mom running away from a zombie. Ellie's mom played by the actor from the game. Uh, she gets bit and then gives birth to Ellie. Marlene is there and Ellie's mom asks her to take Ellie flash forward. Ellie and Joel get captured by Marlene's friends while exploring Salt Lake city. Joel wakes up and Marlene explains that the doctors have Ellie and they need her brain to develop a cure, which would kill Ellie, but they didn't tell her this. Marlene has her friends take Joel away, but Joel kills them and takes their guns. He fights his way through the hospital, killing everyone in his path until he gets to Ellie. He kills the surgeon and takes Ellie away into the parking into the parking lot. Marlene confronts Joel and he kills her. When Ellie wakes up, Joel uh, tells her that they had a they had a ton of immune kids and they still couldn't find a cure. The hospital was attacked and he escaped with her. Ellie doesn't believe him. And before getting back to Tommy's town, she asks him again, Joel doubles down and says that it was the truth series end. Yeah, that's, I mean, that kind of reveals, I think a little bit of the complex nature of love in this situation where Joel now, because he's protecting Ellie and they have this shared horrific experience and she becomes like his daughter to him now. And so in that l- love, there's also pain and suffering. And sometimes you do lie, you know, to um, prevent somebody from knowing, you know, the truth and whether it's right or wrong. Um, you do it as a parent instinctively. Sometimes you just don't reveal the truth because it, it could be more damaging and, Nine times out of a ten, that becomes the wrong decision ultimately, but at the time, it feels right. Yeah, I heard, so. I was li- listening to some guy talk about Joel earlier today, and he says that Joel's character is defined by his willingness to do anything for the people he cares about. Yes. In the first episode, you know, they're going past this, they're driving past this family who asks them for help, and Joel tells them to keep going. We're not stopping for this family because I have my own family to protect. Yeah. Uh, later on, other things happen. Joel will kill anyone for Tess, and then eventually Tess dies, and then he will kill anyone for Ellie. And so at this point, uh, if he loses Ellie, then he he loses his purpose with that family. And so in his mind, like, it's not I'm – in his mind, it's I'm saving Ellie, but when you kind of look at it, it almost – I'm saving myself from, like – yeah, he was willing this. to kill Marlene, and he did. Yeah. Yeah, be, uh, you know, for Ellie and for his purpose, because now, you know, I don't know what he thinks his purpose is other than just to keep Ellie alive or find something, some other way to develop a cure. You know, maybe if he keeps her alive for 5, 10, 20 years, the, the technology will be there in that time. I don't know. Well, I heard this. Yeah. this I don't was know like, where this is going, basically. But this was very interesting because, like, both parties in this decision, the doctors and Joel, both took away Ellie's like ability to choose. The doctors didn't tell Ellie that she was going to die for this. 
and they took away yes. Ellie's decision to die. And once Joel found this out, he killed the doctors and took Ellie away, also taking away her decision to die. The right thing to do would be to like let her decide. Let her decide because yeah. it's her life that she gets to choose. And that ultimately leads to drama down the road that I won't spoil because I've played the second game and you oh, okay. haven't. Yeah. Yeah. I barely played the first game. I mean it was good, but I just kind of ran out of gusto on that one. But so let me ask you this. So if now, do we get into the debate over whether whether or not Ellie's old enough to really accurately decide what's best for her own life yet? Like, I mean, she's what, 15, 14, 15 in the. Well, in I mean, the, either way, like the decision was stolen from her. Like it wasn't Joel's. It wasn't Joel's place to decide to steal Ellie away from these doctors and kill these doctors, ultimately like removing this possibility from happening yeah. at least with this specific circumstance and it wasn't the doctor's decision so you know no matter where you stand on that both of these people both of these parties did wrong by not letting ellie but i think joel in his this decision yeah i think joel in his um in his view of himself as a parent here is taking on the role of deciding ellie's fate for now and that may change later on when she's 18 or 19 or 20 and you know you're kind of in that range where it's generally understood that you know you you've had some life experiences your brain is done forming and you know you're you have a little bit more maturity about you and you can make some of these big decisions like do i want to die for humanity you know not even knowing that it's going to work or not like they didn't know that it was going to work. It hadn't worked in the past. And now they're going to give her a chance and say, if you're in full disclosure, Ellie, hey, it's hadn't worked in the past. Well, we I mean, don't know, but we got to kill you to find out, you know? This was the first person that anyone's ever found to be immune. Like, there may have been other people that were immune before this, but Ellie's the first that was found to be immune. And I really liked their explanation because I don't think they did this in the game, but they explained, like, the reason that they believe Ellie to be immune was because her mom was bit as she was giving birth. Mm -hmm. The infection made its way into Ellie, but it didn't like activate or something. Yeah. And so yeah. the infection, like when it made its way into her again, it just assumed she was already infected, which I don't, I don't know how scientific that is. I don't know how much sense that actually makes in the real world, but I think explanation was fun. Yeah. It, it almost, so, um, early in the podcast, the game producers and show producers were talking about um, the um, uh, so the fungus that infects the cordyceps that is the basis of the illness here, and how um, in reality uh, fungus actually is kind of scarier than a virus because you know um, we right now in 2023 we have there's a fungus that can infect an ant they've shown this with ants and it and it affects the brain and takes over it doesn't kill the ant it doesn't replicate inside the ant and then move on it actually takes over the ant and then the ant exhibits different behavior than what is normally associated with that ant so that fungus actually gains purpose by taking over that ant and so um <clears throat> so but the fungus has to know that, and the theory goes that the fungus knows that it's in a host that is not its own, right? And so it won't, and so that's how the fungus won't kill itself or its other fungus like it is because it knows the difference between the host and itself. Whereas in Ellie, it doesn't see Ellie as the host, it sees Ellie as one of its own. And so that's how it doesn't take over her. An infector. That's what they were saying. Like mm -hmm. that. That's the kind of the basis behind that, which I thought, you know, I don't. I don't guess it was really explained, but it's one of those, one of those things. Maybe in the, uh, what do you call it? Like some of the the Last of Us lore that you could probably uncover yeah. about like the nature of fungus, fungal infections. Yeah, I thought. I also I heard this other thing. The, this other person talking about it, a theory that they had. These doctors, they're here 20 years after, you know, the virus first started. Realistically, they're still like med students trying and they like the virus or the fungus broke out 
when they were still students. They're not like actual real doctors. They're just like the most doctor like people that the society currently has. Oh, you talking about the state of the current doctors yeah. were med students 20 years ago when the society collapsed. And so they likely did not finish their training. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so now like they're expected to solve a problem that we in the current day can't even solve. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever, dude. I mean, that's why you have, that's why you keep trying, you know, like, so you try and learn from your mistakes, you know, and if it fails, then you wait for the next kid to come along that you think is, you know, has some sort of immunity. I don't know. I thought that was funny. Yeah. That's a, that's interesting to think about. Yeah. That's, that's the entire show. What do you, what, what, do you have any theories on what's going to happen next? Um, uh, no, in fact, I have purposefully not considered like what's the next step. Cause I want to be surprised. Cause I was pleasantly surprised. Like I said, when we first started this podcast, I was pleasantly surprised that this was not just about zombies, that there was a lot of character development. There was a lot of background information that you get. There's these themes of of love and how love makes you do crazy things, you know, or, you know, it doesn't, you know, there's horror in, in, in inside of love is like not really horror, but like um, is, you know, there's good like with Frank and Bill, Bill and Frank, there's good and there's bad days. I've had good days and bad days. So and you're going to have that when you're in a long term committed relationship. So um so there is those themes that this show explores. And so, um, you know, it, it's definitely for me, I think it would be worth almost watching the whole series over again. If not, you know, maybe just picking out a few of the episodes that I really liked. Uh, but so those are kind of my closing thoughts. That it, uh, I do not want to know what's going to happen in the second season because I want to be pleasantly surprised. Like I want to be shocked by it. I want... You know, I don't want to read on anything, so I'm going to I'm going to like wall myself off from it and just um, enjoy the entertainment when it happens. I'm really excited for the second season to come out because I I played I, I bought the game day one as soon as it came out. The Last of Us Part Two and I played it with one of my friends and we had a good time and I really liked the game and it's very difficult for me to like avoid saying anything like foreshadowy or whatever because i i think that game is really good and i think if it gets a chance to be a tv series like this then it could be even better so this uh last of us part two the game was better than the first one you're saying or the tv show some people might be real mad at me but i will say i liked part two better than part one and so you're thinking the tv series the second season will be better than the first i don't know if it'll be better that's a tall order. Because I think, like, order. TV production is way different because, like, they try to, they try to like, put it out faster. I think that would happen with White Lotus season one and two. Whereas games, like, everyone understands that they take forever to make mm-hmm. and studios have other things to do and whatever. So I think games get a lot more time to develop. So I'm not, not sure. So I guess this is it, right? Yeah, this is yeah. it. Well, awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me come on your podcast here. I really enjoyed it. I, I was super nervous. I didn't think that I would have this much to talk about, but you did a really good job. Like reading the summaries, I think, helped. And then definitely listening to some of the podcasts about The Last of Us helped a little bit, too. And they have spoilers in there, too. So if you listen to all this and you get enough spoilers, don't go over to that other one because they really reveal some stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you for watching uh if you if you have comments make sure that they're nice because my dad's on this episode you can't be mean yeah don't be mean yeah be nice be nice to everyone thank you for watching bye bye